Outcast, how Jews were banished from the anti-racist imagination. Outcast is an exploration and explanation of how the very possibility of recognising anti-Jewish racism has been displaced by a commonplace left-wing belief that when Jewish people cry anti-Semitism, their true intent is to cover up the racism propagated by Israel against the Palestinians. This is related to the notion that racism is exclusively a colonial phenomenon of white over black domination and it tends to reconstruct the old anti-Semitic form of the Jewish question, which asks what should be done about the harm that Jews pose to humanity. Escaping the confines of identity politics, including one that tends de facto to re-naturalise race, Outcast makes the case for a genuinely universal politics of human liberation. Camilla Bassi is a human geography academic. Her principal research interests are the geographies of race, ethnicity and sexuality and Marxist geographies. Camilla has been a political activist on the British left since 1996. Her blog, Academic on a Bike, contains a range of posts which synthesise her academic ideas with wider political currents. So a very big welcome to Camilla Bassi. Um, Camilla is a human geographer. She um, is at uh, Sheffield Hallam University. Um, Camilla is uh, a UCU I should say comrade, really, colleague, comrade. Um, and the reason I know that and the reason I noticed that is because over the, oh, I don't know how many years it is, 18 years since 2005, Camilla has been a real ally um, in at UCU Congress. Camilla was a person, has always been a person willing to stand up and speak um, against anti-Semitism. And... Um, uh, that is hugely appreciated by many people, including myself. Um, Camilla is a member of the Alliance for Workers' Liberty, which um, uh, is a place where I got a bit of a political education um, earlier on in my life. Um, and she, the Alliance for Workers' Liberty and Camilla too, are part of a very small movement of people who think of themselves um, as belonging on the Trotskyist left, um, but who take anti-Semitism seriously. So um, this is a really interesting fact. And Camilla has written a really, really interesting book. And without any further blah, blah from me, um, I will ask Camilla to uh, share her screen because she has a PowerPoint and to um, tell you about her book and about what she Thanks about anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, David. While I just sort of line up my screen, can I um, offer my sincerest uh, thanks to David and the Centre for um, inviting me to talk about my book? Um, let me just uh, concentrate one minute so I can. OK, um, so, yeah, very much. Thank you. A warm thank you for enabling me to speak today. And um, hopefully there will be ample time for questions and discussion. So in this presentation, I want to do two things uh, and I'll be speaking for approximately 35 uh, minutes. One, I want to offer a synopsis of two um, key interventions that my book Outcast makes to wider academic debate. And two, I want to kind of close the presentation by suggesting some interlocutions of outcast with other recent interventions on the nature of racism and the anti-racist imagination. So the first intervention is into the field of ethnic and racial studies. Um, and I first read um, a book that I think is very central to um, outcast. Um, the Routledge Key Ideas book, Racism by the sociologist Robert Miles, as an undergraduate student in the mid 1990s. In this first edition text that was published in 1989, Robert Miles makes 
a critical observation. Much of the British and North American theorizing about capitalism and racism since the 1960s, while drawing upon the immoral status of racism, which derives to a significant degree from the final solution, utilizes a colonial model, which has little scope to explain much of the European racism of the 19th and 20th centuries, and certainly not that form of racism which others label anti-Semitism. It does, however, uh, have a relevance to the controversial debate about whether or not Zionism can be defined as an instance of racism. Now, a major contribution of uh, Robert Miles's research uh, to the study of uh, race, excuse me, I'm just trying to minimize uh, certain things on my screen, screen here, a major contribution of Robert Miles's research to the study of race and racism is his critique of a dominant body of academic work that sees the origins of racism exclusively in colonialism, one consequence of which is a conceptual deflation of racism to that of a white ideology created exclusively to dominate black people. This approach to racism is shown to have emerged from the rise of the civil rights movement and the increasing scale and intensity of political struggles uh, of the African-American population against racist oppression and inequality in the United States during the 1960s. Since the 1960s, this US approach to um, uh, racism has very much influenced British academic thought on race and racism. So even though uh, racism was central to the rise of um, was, was central to the rise of fascism in Western Europe during the 1930s, the concept of racism since 1945 has evolved and been largely shaped by a need to comprehend colonialism, either in a post-colonial situation or in the context of migration from the ex-colonies into Western European countries. So we have British academic research that has produced theories of racism that are so specific to the history of colonialism that they have limited ability to explain any other context. We're much theorizing, transposing, if you like, the dual camp of colonizer colonized into white versus black, thus further limiting the explanatory power of the concept of racism. So what we have with a colonial model of racism, a deflated concept of racism, is an anti-racist imagination that continues rather than challenges racialized essentialism. That is the idea that humankind consists of people of different races with different intrinsic dispositions. And we are, we are locked within this model into a dualistic struggle and a structural bind of race relations. The problem, put simply, as Robert Miles puts it, is there are no races and therefore no race relations. So instead of exploring how the idea of race intersects with capitalist social relations, race is assumed to be functional to capitalism and to form a fixed and over-totalized structure of oppression. Now, on the face of it, work that seeks to expose the stratified race relations of colonialism, imperialism and capitalism has the weight of being politically progressive. It certainly looks and sounds politically progressive. After all, if you link racism and, and, and capitalism functionally and causally, as Miles puts it, capitalism can be damned for yet another reason. The problem is that you have the rarification of the idea of race. That is, race is made real, rather than understanding that it is the idea of race which has reality. And it's the idea of race which has reality that needs to be explained as emerging from and shaped by fluid uh, conditions and forces of existence. Now, it's worth noting uh, that Paul Gilroy, while he distances himself from the work of uh, Miles, probably because Miles was an early critic of, of, of Gilroy's early work, 
Paul Gilroy later arrives at a similar position to Miles. So in Gilroy's seminal paper, Race Ends Here from 1998, he argues for, I quote, a more consistent effort to denature and deontologize race. And he recognizes that this change, of course, is all the more important because, I quote, the memory of the Nazi genocide has ceased to form the constellation under which we strive to do critical work in this area. In other words, by making race real, the lens of what is racism in critical research on race no longer sees anti-Semitism. So, in Outcast, primarily drawing upon the work of Robert Miles, along with the scholarship of George Mosser, I offer a holistic overview uh, of the prehistory and the history of racism that reintegrates anti-Jewish racism as an ideological component of racism, and indeed a central and consistent ideological component from the mid 19th century onwards, which drew from and reworked much earlier representations of the Jewish other. And from this history, I think a number of important points um, come to light and are discussed in the book. So, um, quoting Miles again, while colonialism was an integral moment in the history of racism, it was actually the articulation between the capitalist mode of production and the nation state, rather than between capitalism and colonialism, that mapped the primary set of social relations within which racism had its origins and initial effects. Another point is that the racist imagination does not require skin colour as a marker of signification to the existence of harmful races. Even though it has used skin color, it does not require it. Why? Um, quoting Miles and Torres, because people do not see race. They continue, they observe certain combinations of real and sometimes imagined somatic and cultural characteristics to which they attribute meaning with the idea of race. Indeed, as the French academic uh, Colette Gullimin shows, in the history of um, racial science, along with apparent physical characteristics uh, of different racial groups during the first half of the 19th century, other racial denominators that were social and cultural traits began to emerge. So from philological research, for example, the identification of different language groups very quickly became part of racial systems of somatic classification. It was a short step from here she observes, to the idea of Indo-European and Semitic races. And as George Mosser notes, it became usual in anti-Semitic works for Jews to speak a mixture of German and Yiddish, a jargon from which not even a Rothschild could escape. The linguistic abilities of African Negroes were treated with similar contempt. So through a colonial model of racism and the rarification of race and skin colour, um, academics focusing on the negative racialization of somatic difference, bodily difference, exclusively see only some forms of racism. However, when the racist imagination classifies race, the indicators chosen are, quoting Gulliman, a matter of politics rather than objective reality, as illustrated by the Nazis deciding who was and who was not a Jew. Racial classification, then, is based on social imagination and political decision making, not real innate differences between human beings. Now, if the colonial model of racism and its white over black dualism renders other forms of racism invisible, this model seems particularly ill-equipped to see racism that works on the very idea of the invisible enemy within. While the Jewish other has been racialized physically, this other has also been racialized as an invisible threat. The absence of visibility here has been used to the advantage of the racist imagination. Quoting Miles, the very fact that there are so few living Jews can become socially accepted as proof of either the real extent of Jewish power or of the continued success of Jews in assimilating themselves, of hiding in order to continue their destructive work. 
Another idea that is discussed in the book is, is the central idea that ricochets down the tunnel of anti-Jewish racist ideology, that Jews are immoral capitalists who make money in devious ways, unlike the Aryans who make money by honest work. One prominent racial scientist claiming the inferior races such as the yellow race and the Jews were without scruples and had no sense of values being wholly commercial. Aryan commercial science society lives by honest work. The Aryans care about values with which they speculate. The Jews love speculation for its own sake. So this idea of the deceitful Jew who exists in contrast to honest capitalism this idea arises also in the contribution to racism from English intellectuals. So for the Scottish racial scientist, Robert Knox, author of Races of Man, he had as his primary enemy, the Jew, who reflects, I quote, the distorted image of the bourgeoisie, cunning, scheming, ursurous. This historical idea adds context to the Jew of contemporary anti-Jewish racism, who is an enemy of both the right and the left as a free thinking socialist poisoning hearts and minds, and as a cutthroat capitalist bleeding the workers to death, as Philip Cohen puts it. One final point I wanna to touch upon that arises from the history of racism that I discuss in my book is how the ideas of race and nation, as Miles and Brown state, were not so much identical as mutual reflections. Racism and nationalism are mutual reflections. So from the non-national nation to the international nation, the idea of the Jews as the enemy within the nation and the enemy beyond the nation, plotting behind the scenes and living off immoral capitalism is a critical and persistent ideological thread of anti-Jewish racism. The geography of the wandering Jew is central here. The Jewish other, who is a threat to the self, cannot be geographically fixed and located, even when there is a nation state of Jews since this nation state is judged to be innately territorially hungry and, and expansive, capable of exceptional global control, just checking that my son's uh, dressed appropriately, capable of, sorry, so let's just start again. The geography of the wandering Jew is central. The Jewish other, who is a threat to the self, cannot be geographically fixed and located, even when there is a nation state of Jews, since this nation state is judged to be innately territorially hungry and expansive, capable of exceptional global control and to be the global laboratory and globalization of the world's ills. As such, termination of terminus Israel is prescribed. Both before and after Israel, Jews are a portrayal of the nation state and nationalism and the essence of bad capitalism from the enemy of the nation state to the enemy nation state all the while representing the harms of capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism. Indeed, as Philip Cohen remarks, as soon as wandering Jews began to put down roots, they became even more dangerous. Now, he says, it's the very tenaciousness of Jewish culture, which is the threat. So one intervention of outcast then, is into the study of race and racism oh. to redress the banishment of Jewish people as victims of racism. The other related intervention is in the field of post-colonial studies, since the banishment of Jewish people as victims of racism is a consequence of their demotion as racist pariahs. As Robert Fine and Glynis cousin astutely observe, the ghost of Israel-Palestine haunts the current separatism between racism and anti-Semitism. Oh. To recap uh, oh. then, where we're at at the moment, um, the tendency of contemporary Anglo-American academic work on race and racism to bypass consideration of anti-Jewish racism can be seen as a consequence of the colonial model of racism. Emerging out of the political struggles of the African-American population in the 1960s, this colonial model places the origins of racism exclusively in the history of slavery and colonialism and conceptualizes racism as the persistence of white structural power and dominance over black people. Now, the 1960s was significant also for the development of the new left and the shift of much of the revolutionary left on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict after Israel's expansionist victory in the June 1967 war. 
to absolute hostility to Israel as a national entity. After 1967, for much of the left, Palestine has become the global symbolic vanguard of anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism and anti-racism. If the colonial model of racism emerging out of the 1960s exiled anti-Jewish racism and platformed Zionism as racism, then after 1967, the general circulation of anti-Jewish racist ideas gained traction in the leftist milieu and ignited the fire that exhorts Zionism as the evil incarnate of imperialism, colonialism and racism. Crucially, during the 1960s and 70s, the academy was the space for the intersection of the colonial model of racism and this new absolute hostility to Israel. And I think the success of uh, Edward Said's uh, book, Orientalism, a foundational text of post-colonial studies, reflects this. This book was written in response to the Western media portrayal of Arabs in the June 1967 war, and was published in 1978, one year after the election for the first time of a right-wing government in Israel. Outcast is a challenge to um, the academic post-colonial left, specifically to an analysis of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that fuses a colonial model of racism with the Jewish question, the Jewish question being the representation of Jews as harmful to humanity. Now, in his book, Confronting anti-Semitism on the left, Daniel Randall identifies and explores three historical strands to left anti-Semitism. One, uh, primitive anti-Semitism in which capitalism is viewed and problematized as innately Jewish. Two, the, commun uh, the conspiracy theories of the so-called communist bloc, um, especially from the 1950s against a supposed secret cabal of cosmopolitan and Zionist Jews. And three, uh, a Stalinist absolute anti-Zionism that frames Zionism, Jewish nationalism as a transcendent force of imperialism, colonialism and racism. And it seems likely that this Stalinist absolute anti-Zionism shaped the general approach of the new left to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict after 1967. Indeed, the independent Marxist scholar and Orientalist Maxine Rodinson, who features prominently in my book, cautions of Said's Orientalism, that it is, I quote, a polemic against Orientalism written in a style that was a bit Stalinist, that it that is in its dual camp delineation of the world uh, into adversaries and allies, which here translates into colonial settler versus native, white versus black, harmful Jew versus Palestinian victim. The problem with this leftist dual camp is that it fetishizes and inverts the bourgeois dual camp of major imperialist powers who present geopolitical moments as a moral choice between civilization versus barbarism, good versus evil. And in the process, it substitutes consideration of the politics of particular camps for the principle of my enemy's enemy is my friend. The task instead is to construct an alternative and independent force of political thought and action by and for the interest of working classes, trade unionists, secularists, anti-racists, feminists, queer activists, and so on, that can transcend our socially constructed differences that divide humankind, such as nationality, religion, and race. The dual camp here is also a cultural essentialization of two camps of people. It's an identity politics, not a class politics. So within post-colonial studies, uh, as I show in my book, there's a distinction that's drawn between colonialism and settler colonialism, with the former operating through a logic of exploitation and the latter through a logic of elimination. And the settler colonial paradigm is used to judge Israel-Palestine. Now, while this paradigm potentially opens up a wide ranging uh, set of sites of comparison, as Rachel Busbridge observes, in actuality, there's a particularly strong emphasis on white European settler colonialism, vis-a-vis -vis Americas, Australasia, and Israel, Palestine, to um, the admission, the neglect of other settler colonial relationships like Russia, Chechnya, China, Tibet, or more recently, Russia, Ukraine. An academic understanding of the world through a colonial model of racism, and I think Orientalism fits into this, explains this phenomena, it seems to me. 
the story of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict fits or is rather made to fit a dualistic racialized schema. The story here is a simple story, Ilan Pape tells us. It's a story of white people who were persecuted in Europe, who drove away the black people who used to live here. He continues, the villains who present themselves as heroes are the Israelis. Pape again, they were and are the servants of the bureaucracy of evil. They come quite innocent into the system, but only the very few among them do not succumb to its raison d'etre and modus operandi. Here explicitly you have white Jews, black Palestinians racialized into culturally essentialist groups with the Jews signified as submissive lackeys of evil. The task Pape insists is to expose, isolate and revoke Israel as a pariah state. The takeaway message to Jews associated with Israel and Zionism is repent or be doomed. So I demonstrate in my book how post-colonial academic criticism of Israel and Zionism is an essentialized and exceptionalized damnation. Such a criticism is done through the lens of the Jewish question. So within this literature, you have the following presented, represented. What is to be done with a nation state guilty of ethnic cleansing and racism on par with South African apartheid and Nazi Germany? What is to be done with Zionism's national racism that has even gone so far as to historically present itself as socialist? What is to be done with so-called left-wing Jews who fail to see the origins of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in 1948, not 1967? What is to be done with the Jews who have failed to learn their lesson from the Holocaust? What is to be done with the innate drive within Zionism and Zionist Jews to ethnically cleanse to the destiny of genocide? The conclusion to um, the post-colonial academic left's Jewish question is undo Israel. I think what's interesting therein is the spatial and temporal aspects of a racialized, racist construction uh, uh, of Zionism. So Zionism is, is, is seen as spatially fluid with a territorial hunger and global reach that knows no bounds and temporarily frozen. So on the temporal aspect, Joyce Dalsham astutely identifies a contradictory anachronism employed in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. She notes some people out of time arouse anger, revulsion, condemnation, while others inspire sympathy. So Jewish territorial nationalism and Jewish settlers in the occupied territories are out of time, provoking denunciation. Palestinians as a national group cannot advance toward national liberation as they are trapped in a settler colonialism that is out of time, provoking pity. The answer to the Jewish question presents here as Jews must give up their national home to belong to civilization. What's interesting is that the Palestinians too are racialized. Palestinians need to realize their national home to at last belong to civilization. So what we have is the stage cast in post-colonial analysis for the heroes and the villains with no room for nuance. For example, on the one hand, there's no intellectual room to consider the Jewish settler who lives in the occupied territories because they can't afford housing inside Israel, uh, or the settler who's open, open to coexisting with Palestinians in a liberated Palestine alongside Israel. On the other hand, there's no inclination to critically assess the reactionary politics and military tactics of Islamist resistance. The Jewish question in this literature outcasts Jews from the universal human collective and less penitent of the sins of Israel and Zionism and romanticize those in defiance of such Jews. The colonizers, Israeli Jews and Jewish settlers are, are deemed to require, I quote, uh, a deem to require a radical psychological shift and deconstruction of a certain narcissism based on an illusionary identity, because colonialism creates monsters out of men. The colonized Palestinian Islamists are subalterns, continue quoting, with legitimate reasons for rebelling against Israeli occupation. We may abhor their use of violence, but guess that it might disappear were they liberated. Both actors are essentialized and given innately negative in the case of the Jews or innately positive in the case of the Palestinians consequences. 
one state advocates uh, within post-colonial academic work are unified in their attack on a separatist, essentialist settler colonial project, uh, a political Zionism, as they see it. However, any academic position that strays from this absolute polarity between settler and native is considered uh, within this body of scholars, as Busbridge states, uh, any position that strays from this absolute polarity is considered uh, assimilationist or worse still, genocidal in effect, if not intent. Notably, you have a binational one state solution, which is a minority position coming from within the body of post-colonial academic work that's rejected and marginalized as an entrenchment and a legitimation of colonial relations, despite the plea of some to acknowledge the present reality of two national groups and to thus engage with the rights claims of Jewish Israelis to alleviate their fears of expulsion in the event of decolonization. Anything less than the full and recognizing and undoing of the right of the Jewish people to national self-determination is considered immoral and an anathema to genuine decolonization. Virginia Tilly, for example, suggests that seeing a Palestinian people and a Jewish people in need of territorial self-determination is an unacceptable acceptance of an ethno-nationalism which is aberrant, anachronistic and ruinous. Now, Busbridge incisively observes that the absolutist solution of decolonization here is, is no solution at all, because a faithful adherence to the paradigm of settler colonialism renders decolonization largely unachievable, if not impossible. So what we have is a conflict that hurtles from the past to the present into the future, never to be uh, fully extinguished until the native is or until history itself ends. The story becomes one of, I quote Lorenzo Berrichini, one of the main theoreticians of the settler colonialism paradigm, the story becomes one of either total victory or total failure, with the fantasy of one victorious Palestinian state making room for the Jews only as a neutral, neutral and repentant collectivity. So you have a zero sum game of post-colonial analysis on the Palestinian Israeli conflict. And again, it can only be understood through its Jewish question. While other nation states have come into existence through settler colonialism, these are assumed through the passage of time, fait complice. But there are two reasons offered as to why Israel proper must not be considered a fait accompli. The first reason offered is that Israel arrived too late in a world that has moved on to decolonization. Here, the Jewish question presents as the Jewish nation state and the Jews associated with it are uniquely stuck in the past and are an outstanding impediment to human progress, thus belong to the discipline of human history. The position of Tony Jutt reflects this when he states, the problem with Israel is not, as it's sometimes suggested, that it's a European enclave in the Arab world, but rather it arrived too late. A second reason we are told is that Zionism is the globalizing crucible, the globalizing crucible of colonialism, imperialism, social dispossession, injustice, and repression. Here, the Jewish question presents as Israel and Zionism are the inventories, testers, and exporters of global ills. Again, as Lorenzo Verrucini puts it, Palestine today is a crucial laboratory of global dispositions prior to being transferred that is sold elsewhere. So while one aspect of the Jewish question view Zionism as an outlier or latecomer in a post-colonial era. The other aspects see Zionism as the present to future precedent for ethnic cleansing and genocide of indigenous peoples worldwide. Berrichini again, expulsions are the present and future. Zionism is not a latecomer, it's a precursor. So once they advocates of the settler colonialism paradigm thus regard themselves as, as part of a global decolonization battle against Zionism. Palestine is hence accorded, in the words of Busbridge, a prophetic role in the global struggle against colonialism and imperialism. So Outcast shows how the post-colonial academic left approaches the Palestinian-Israeli conflict through a moralistic settler colonialism paradigm that sees Israel and Zionism as the ultimate historical vestiges and or harbingers of colonialism, racism and genocide worldwide. This conflict 
is seen to be bound up with a global anti-racist struggle and project of decolonization in which the priority enemy is Zionist racism. The settler colonialism paradigm turns Zionism into a monster with an insatiable appetite for ethnic cleansing who will stop at nothing up to and including genocide. The Palestinians are made into victims and only the victims. The moral stains of the 20th century, the Holocaust and South African apartheid are brought together to reveal the Israel of the now 21st century as the worst of the worst nation states and settler colonialisms. The Zionist Jews are presented as the contemporary Nazis, the Palestinians, the modern day victims of the concentration camps. Even when assessed under the seemingly wider comparative lens to other New World white settler societies, Israel still incongru incongruently represents an exceptional harm to humanity, which demands undoing in entirety as a historical reality. In the words of Robert Fine and Philip Spencer, the othering of the Jews creates an inequitable economy of compassion and a restrictive arena of solidarity. In its spiritless radicalism, it at once turns Israel into the primary source of violence in the world and places Palestinians into a single identity script as victims, only as victims and only as victims of, of Israel. Just as it subsumes the polarity of Jewish voices to the Jews and the polarity of Israeli voices to Israel, it subsumes the plurality of Palestinian voices to the Palestinians and risks turning them into ciphers of our own resentments. A tragedy of the post-colonial left approach is that it offers no way out for the Palestinians and the Israelis other than a zero-sum game, which is itself a dead end. The leftist imagination here sees Zionism as a particularly deplorable affliction on an obstacle to the progress of humanity and operates zero tolerance for anything other than the dissolution of Israel, along with contrite, shamefaced Jews ready to denounce their collective Jewish identity. This is the Jewish question writ large. So as a way out uh, and a way forward, outcast resuscitates a Marxist tradition to the Jewish collective and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that is free from the Jewish question and which takes into account the historical context of European anti-Semitism, colonialism and nationalism. Notably, I excavate the work of the late independent Marxist scholar Maxine Rodinson as an exemplar of how the racist and colonial dimensions of Israel can be comprehended relatively without an absolute, without an absolute moral damnation of the Jewish collective or a moralistic resolve to destroy Israel. Uh, another way out offered in the book, recognising what Gilroy refers to as our overwhelming sameness, in Outcast, I present the writings of uh, Cornell West and Henry Louis Gates Jr. on black antisemitism, their challenge to black antisemitism as an opening for discussion with a left that regards itself as avant in the fight against anti-black racism, while it dismisses with contempt uh, anti-Jewish racism in its ideological ranks. In sum, the book is an effort for solidarity that escapes the restrictions of race and other politicized identities which divide and exclude us, and instead calls for a genuinely universal alliance of political and human imagination. Now, prior to uh, ending the presentation uh, and opening uh, the discussion up to the audience, I want to offer two thoughts on how Outcast potentially converses with other recent work on racism and anti-racism. Uh, in his book, Multi-Racism, Rethinking Racism in Global Context, the uh, geographer Alistair Bonnet also points out the consequences of framing the study of racism in the black and white terms of a US context, such that, I quote, anti-black racism is made visible at the cost of the invisibility of other racisms from other parts of the world and from within Europe, including the Holocaust. What Bonnet coins the Western racism paradigm, which dominates ethnic and racial studies, prevents a study of racism that is genuinely international by ignoring, downplaying and denying what are in actuality, I quote, cross-hatching and intermingling sites of modern racism in most of the world. He proposes a focus on plural racisms and plural modernities. And in reading um, Alistair's book, 
Um, one of the things uh, and his proposal of a way forward, uh, what, one, of, what, one of the pieces of work that it brings to my mind is the work of Isabella Taborowski on the reworking of the protocols of the elders of Zion by Zionologists in Stalinist Russia into a Marxist critique of Zionism for the Communist Party bureaucracy and a global left audience. This work, Taborowski's work, does, I think, precisely what Bonnet is calling for by exploring the cross-hatching and intermingling sites of modern racism. Another, uh, and I'll end on this slide, another potential interlocution of outcasts is with Kenan Malik's book, Not So Black and White. Now, to his credit, his work is also an effort at reintegrating anti-Jewish racism into an understanding of racism more generally. However, he does something quite odd, I think, uh, in uh, a chapter following his chapter, The Reinvention of Jew Hatred, uh, in a chapter titled Barbarism Comes Home. In the chapter Barbarism Comes Home, he applies the idea of the imperial boomerang. The truth, he states, that Europeans have to face about Nazism, the Martinique poem and statesman Amy Césaire wrote, is that before they were its victims, they were its accomplices. That they tolerated that Nazism before it was inflicted on them, that they absolved it, shut their eyes to it, legitimised it, because until then it had been applied only to non-European peoples. So in this idea of the imperial boomerang, the Holocaust is seen as the product of a blowback an inevitable and familiar horror inflicted on white bodies as a result of the horrors which white people have inflicted on black bodies. Uh, elsewhere, in the words of the academic Kahinda Andrews, he says, uh, Andrews says of the imperial boomerang, I quote, we see very clearly with the Nazis the boomerang effect where racism, fascism, the logic of white supremacy comes into Europe and becomes enacted on white bodies and everyone turns around and goes, wow, this was a really bad idea, end quote. I think similar to much of the left's obsession with a blowback thesis after 9-11, uh, which by fixating on the crimes of US imperialism neglected any critique of the politics of Islamism, the idea of imperial boomerang as it's applied to the Holocaust neglects the deep history of the representation and persecution against the Jewish other. And it seems to me that the imperial boomerang falls within this colonial model of racism and once again banishes Jewish people and banishes anti-Jewish racism. So I'm going to just end the presentation here. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop screen sharing and uh, take it from there. I can only uh, apologise for my five-year-old intervening it's 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 a it's a crazy time of the evening for children sorry about that may i ask uh, something I introduced myself, I am in London. Um, I was born to Iraqi Jewish uh, parents, like half of the population of Israel. We are from uh, the former Ottoman Empire. I just want to say, just look at how plausibly Constantinople is considered to have been part of the greater Europe. It was a participant like Egypt was before it was invaded in 1882 of the colonial enterprises. The Ottoman Empire wanted to sell its uh, supposed rights to the port cities of East Africa to, to the European uh, powers. And the fact is that also Edward Said, for example, I, as a Middle Easterner, I've always uh, noticed how he practices Occidentalism. That is the phenomenon that arose in Syria in the 1820s when um, uh, Christians had in their diaries absorbed from uh, French merchants ideas of the new far right of Europe 
uh, uh, that is in order to articulate the old animals against the Jews. And the fact is that um, whatever comes out of the lecture about what you have exposed so cleverly, actually to me is just uh, absolute supremacism of people who are Westerners and that they are still the ones who are to dictate how we are to live and how we are to die. But there is another thing. I, on such a days, used to walk past the Basilica of Sant'Ambrogio in Milan, my city. And the fact is that the difference between his pupil, Augustan of Hippo, and uh, Ambrose of Milan was that Ambrose of Milan wanted the, the Jews to go away like all other uh, identities, none had to be remain, to remain. Whereas Augustine made an exception for the Jews who were to subsist as ab uh, abject and rich witnesses to the triumph of the church. But in the sense, what we have seen since 1848 is several millenarism. Even Zionism is a kind of millenarism in that perspective. And it may be that what we witness now in uh, the left ideology about Israel and the Jews, it's just the idea that even to Augustine, uh, at the end of uh, days, the Jews should no longer survive. Because if we have the millennium, there is no reason to exist anymore. And perhaps this is the reason that both the Nazis and other groups who are radical Westerners and not uh, tolerant have developed the idea of the urgency of doing away with the Jews. Thank you. Uh, but I, I can't hear you, um, Balax. I don't know whether other people can hear you. I'm happy to while you're yeah um figuring what's happened to your mic i'm happy i think daniel's got his hand up did daniel do you want to, uh, do you want to come in while yeah if you don't mind i hope you can hear me good <laughs> that's a good starting point so i found it really interesting and stimulating i learned a lot from it but i found one thing that you touched on but didn't really develop i mean i appreciate you only had 30 minutes it's a vast vast subject but it, it seems to me that the, and you alluded to as well a bit, the one of the difficulties in understanding the subject is that, to me anyway, the left doesn't mean what the left used to mean 30, 40, 50 years ago. And parallel to that, anti-racism doesn't mean what it used to mean 30, 40, 50 years ago. So the left, as you kind of alluded to, are not vastly generalizing, but was primarily about class and universalism and social transformation. Whereas now it's about uh, identity politics and about, I, I would argue, I don't know your view on this, but kind of rehabilitate, rehabilitating a kind of racial form of thinking. Uh, and it seems to me the problem that we have now uh, is that, whereas, you know, again, if you look at the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King and so on, that kind of era, it was about transcending race or color blindness, now a very much derided concept, trying to recognizing the differences between people but trying to transcend them. Now it seems to be that many of those people who call themselves anti-racists are actually re-racializing society you know, through identity politics. And then it seems to me that Jews suffer as a result. I mean, if you begin to see society again in racial terms, then Jews are one of the main groups that suffers as a result. So uh, maybe if you had now, you talked about that, but I'd be interested in your take on those kind of themes. 
Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. There's a there's a a, a brilliant um, book on the uh, the demise of class politics and the rise of anti um, identity politics on the left, and it's by um, Wendy Brown um, called State State of Injury. And, and she says we need to kind of supplant a politics of I am for a, a politics of I want this for us. We need to start believing in get again in, in the dream of freedom. And a lot of where we're at on the left is because of a retreat from class politics. I mean, even, um, you know, the so-called Trotskyist left thinks it's waging a class war against Israel, but actually it's waging a cultural war against the Jews um, in effect uh and i couldn't i couldn't agree with you more really on that i guess uh the, the book itself is a um is very kind of consciously and deliberately an academic intervention into ethnic and racial studies post-colonial studies what's interesting within the post-colonial academic literature is actually it's not that dissimilar in terms of its political conclusions to um you know, the Socialist Workers' Party, which is how, you know, Ilan Pape can publish uh, in post-colonial journals and also do public meetings for the Socialist Workers' Party. There's Because they both operate a, a, a politics of, of dual camp, um, a politics of my enemy's enemy is my friend, um, uh, uh, which, which uh, negates class politics. And what's interesting, um, is how the left has responded to um, all of the past several, several, what is it, 36 weeks or so now uh, of anti-Netanyahu protest movements in, in, in Israel. Um, and I think the, the, the primary uh, commentary that the Socialist Workers Party put out um, quite early on was to the effect of look away, there's nothing to see here, uh, just the bunch of Israeli Jews squabbling amongst themselves about how best to, to, to oppress the Palestinians. I mean, that's, that's disgraceful. Um, one of the most hopeful aspects of, of this protest movement as it's evolved from, uh, from what I can tell from independent journalists on the ground is that that minority block that has argued um, for um, kind of combining a critique against Netanyahu with um, uh, anti-occupation politics that that minority block is is, is growing it's it's gaining traction but um in general it, the israeli jewish working class is is just holistically written off because it is culturally essentialized what's interesting is i think this 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 racialized identity politics a lot a lot of the british left uh, needs that they need the enemy of Israel and Zionism to stay in place because they need that other to sustain their own identity, their own sense of kind of political being, um, which I guess is sort of like me kind of venturing into kind of like the psychology of it. But I, you know, having been active on the left since the age of nineteen, um, you know, this book is kind of one effort on the part of a long term effort to understand why the left is so fixated with the Jews. Um, Efran, I, I um, just in response to you, I, I, I absolutely, um, uh, uh, I absolutely uh, listened with interest uh, and agreement to kind of your observations. I really don't have anything to add. I thought what you said was 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 rich in observational detail. So um, Balak, so you, are you have you got voice now? I can't hit. Can anyone else hear him? Is it just me? I, I don't mind. I don't mind sort of chairing until he's got a voice. So uh, at all. I have this role in my union branch. Does anyone else want to ask me a question or make a comment? Can I just ask something? Please do. Yeah. Sorry. I, my, my name is Stephen Gilchrist. I'm not sure whether my name's up or not, but... <clears throat> No, I'm just wondering whether any of this, as I see it, intellectualization or attempt to rationalize anti-Semitism actually helps. Isn't this, in essence, an irrational hatred of the other? I mean, 
you know, one can try and justify it, rationalize it, intellectualize it as much as you like, but at the end of the day, something goes wrong. People suffer, people feel they're oppressed, they try to blame somebody. For 2,000 years, it's been the Jews because the Jews apparently killed Christ. I mean, isn't that the real essence of all of this? I mean, you can try and intellectualize it as much as you like, but really, isn't that the point of all of this? I couldn't agree with you more. I was at um, uh, the, I'm a human geographer. I was at the uh, our kind of annual international um, conference down in London at the end of August on an author meets critics panel, and and a member of the audience was um, was was really put out. You know, she said, you know, why have you written this book? You know, of, of, of course, you know, Israel is, you know, exceptionally bad. And, you know, I pushed her and I pushed her and I said, well, why is it that no other nation, you know, why is it that you're demanding of no other nation state in 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 the world, its dissolution? And she just could, she couldn't give me an answer because you're right, you know, at the heart of it, it's, it's, it's not coherent. It's not rational. No. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more. But I mean, the, the point I'm trying to make is really that, you know, one can go back into history, one can quote this, that and the other, and one can intellectualise the thing. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this hatred is just completely irrational. And uh, there is no basis for it. There's no justification for it. Jews, Jews don't rule the world. Jews don't create, you know, don't, don't, don't rule the entire banking system throughout the world. They don't rule the global economy. They just don't. I mean, and and it's madness to, you know it, it is just completely irrational so to try and sort of you know try and find out how why this has arisen how 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 people why people think like this it is is pointless in a way i'm sorry i'm not criticizing your 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 work but i mean and i would i would say, say to anybody david Hirsch included i mean what is the point of this i mean it is completely irrational can I can I, I say um, something? So I yeah I'll, I'll oh yeah please sorry who was can I just briefly come back and then yeah, whoever please. just wanted to come in I'll, I'll let you come in. So I teach um, undergraduate uh, geography students on the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and I say you know within the literature this is the dominant narrative, and I present uh, the post-colonial academic literature on it, and they sit there and you can see they're they're pretty uneasy. Uh, about what's being presented to them. And then I I say, after kind of two, three weeks of, of, of presenting these arguments, I say, here's, here's, here's an alternative history. And they start to see the connections. And I would say, in all of the 10 years or 10 plus years I've been teaching this, for these undergraduate students, the majority of the class get it. They get the nature of anti-Semitism. They get the nature of anti-Semitism on the left. They get the nature of anti-Semitism as it exists within the academic literature. To me, if the if, if the you know Ilan Pape is is lost, but there's an audience, isn't there? And I think the whole point of uh, our interventions, our challenges, is to, to is to the vast middle ground. I've got family members. I mean, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I've got family members that have, have, have read the book because, of course, they should. They're their loyal family members and said, oh, we've changed our mind. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the commonplace ideas about the nature of Israel are really, really pervasive. But there are, you know, there 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 is a, a, a vast, um, you know, there is a vast group of people, you know, within union branches, uh, within, you know, the wider community and also within, you know, our academic university spaces that can be convinced uh, that can start to understand what anti-Jewish racism is and start to understand how much it is a problem. Right. So who there was three people putting up their hands. Who was it? There was there Daniel, Tom and Leslie. Was it Tom, then Daniel, Leslie in that order? Is that you? Should we say Tom? OK. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> I'm really pleased that you're taking this, um, your approach out to leftist circles. I think that's very important in trade unions. I'm really hoping you you you, you bring in this analysis and your understanding is going to change hearts and minds in that way. Um, and I also great sympathy with some ancient hatreds and 
primitive models of anti-Semitism. But there's one question which you've not touched upon, but you probably have in your book. Uh, so I'm picking on it. But there is a different question with Israel. I think it's a valid one. Uh, it doesn't uh, validate all the racist assumptions about its existence, but it is a relationship with America. And it is often seen as, uh, you know, Israel is seen as its, its strong ally in the Middle East. Okay, we've got the Saudi Arabia question as well, which makes it more complicated and confusing at times. So there is this alliance, alliance of friendship. You could even see the source of the Abraham Accords, whatever you view as of that, between America and Israel. Perhaps you just comment in your own perspective on that. I'm going to take up, I'm going to come back on that because I'm just going to dig out the, 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 the bit in the book that there's a quote that I want to just kind of go through. But um, I'm going to take Daniel and then Leslie and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you on that, Tom. Just to say, I, I couldn't disagree more strongly with Stephen. I'm, I'm surprised uh, that he hasn't been taken up because one thing that I'm absolutely certain about in relation to anti-Semitism is that if you do not understand specifics, you will not defeat it. If you just say, oh, it's 2,000 years of hatred, it dates back to Christ. If that's your understanding, you will not defeat it. And in fact, there is a rational basis to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is despicable and it needs to be fought, it needs to be battled, but in each different historical period, we need to understand the rational basis to anti-Semitism. So just to take one example, if you take the emergence of anti-Semitism as a form of racism in the 19th century uh, in Central Europe, you, you had the emergence of capitalism, you had a huge amount of social dislocation, a lot of people suffering as a result, and Jews, for reasons I haven't got into, became the symbol for the dislocating effects of capitalism and modernity. So it wasn't a question of Jews being scapegoated. I think Hannah Arendt very correctly argues against that. It was that Jews somehow, because of their social and economic position, became a symbol of social dislocation. And a lot of people re were really suffering as a result of that dislocation. Obviously, they were completely wrong to blame the Jews, and that was a problem, but there was a rational basis to it. And I think you can say the same in relation to the Israel discussion, and other forms of uh, uh, anti-Semitism. There's no way that we can beat it. There's no way we can defeat it unless we understand the rational basis to it in different historical periods and the different forms that it takes. Sorry, Daniel, can I just come back on that briefly? Uh, I, I, I take it all in good heart, but I mean, you know, what, what Jonathan Sachs, our chief rabbi in the UK said, it's the truth, isn't it? That that you know, anti-Semitism was originally about our religion. It was then about our race. It's now about our national homeland. And the point is, why is it always the Jews? You know, you can you can you can justify it as much as you like about you know there, there are social problems in a particular country and there's dislocation and and so on. But why is it always the Jews that get blamed? Well, and, I and take a dip. I it's take irrational. A I, it's not irrational. I take the opposite point. I agree with Jonathan Sachs entirely. But what I would take from what he said was that Christian Jew hatred, racial anti-Semitism, and hatred of Israel are different and have different rational bases to them. And anyway, it's not not a discussion between you and me, but I would have a different take on his his view on that. Yeah, well, I think okay. we may have to disagree on that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take Leslie and then I'm gonna respond to uh Tom's point and because I've got the luxury of now chairing I'm gonna um if anyone else who wants to kind of come in and make a comment or, or a question if you wanted to kind of indicate now um because otherwise I'll aim to sort of close the seminar I don't know when you normally end but aim to close before half past the hour only because my two children are, are still up and I think I need to help my partner out okay um Leslie please come in um, thanks for your um, fabulous presentation, Camilla. Um, as you know, I've read the book and I uh, really think it's a great book. Um, and, I, I'm, you know, it's a kind of practical question that follows on from what Tom said and, and uh, a couple of other people. How, how do you get the people who need to read your book to read it? I understand your family read it because they're your family. But, you know, I mean... I won't mention any names, but I can think of people in our UCU branch who need to read this book. Um, how, you know, just how is there any way that 
that that can happen because it's a problem, I think. Can, I mean, have, can I just ask, have any of them read it? Any of your colleagues in the UCU branch read it or no? So is there anything that can be done to persuade them to read it? Absolutely. Um, well, it's a really good question. So I'll respond to Leslie, then Tom, I, I, I am going to get back to you. Um, in fact, Leslie, at the end of our, Leslie and I are both in the same um, branch, um, which, you know, I mean, you know, Leslie and others have had a horrid time in that branch when it comes to, um, well, anti-Semitism in UCU, which, you know, uh, seems to be kind of distilled down in a particularly concentrated form in, in my branch. So at the end of the branch meeting today, Leslie, uh, you know, uh, one of our colleagues, Peter, I won't mention his surname, uh, publicised Asad Win Stanley's book. So I did intervene at that point to 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 promote my own book. But I think I've invited I've I, I've invited um, all the main outspoken people on the question of. Um, Israel and Zionism, who basically uh, hold to a kind of what we would consider kind of an anti-Semitic anti-Zionism. I, I, I proposed a debate. So I've yeah. gone to someone, you know, I've gone to people and said, I will debate anyone uh, within the UCU branch at Hallam, at Sheffield mm -hmm. University. Uh, that was that was turned down. But it's 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 an ongoing issue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um I suppose where where I'm hopeful is 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 that audience within those branch meetings and more generally that is just unsure you know you know there's two sides here I'm really uncomfortable I don't know enough about it I think in the first instance that's the readership um of the book I'm pleased within my own discipline that um the you know the book is getting taken up in it, <clears throat> getting reviewed in the main journals but it's an institutionalized problem. I mean, one of the mm. things that depressed me about writing Outcast is that we can look at figures like David Miller and go, well, he's an obvious, you know, he, his ideas are obviously anti-Semitic. Why is it so many academics support him? But it's an obvious case. But actually, a lot of what he says is um, the dominant mm. left position mm. on Israel and Zionism. Mm. Um, so... Uh, it was great to have the opportunity to, to, to write this book because actually trying to get it published in uh, a major academic journal in the social sciences would be really, really difficult. Mm. We do have, a, you know, an, an institutionalised problem there. So mm. uh, it's an open question, isn't it, Leslie? Mm. You, know, what, mm. you know, I've written the book, but, but, but mm. you know, what do we do? How, how do we how do we get stuff out then? I think it's a, it's a slow process of, of, of attrition, really. Um, Tom, Camilla, can I just ask you uh, ask you one question about David? Can Miller? I just respond to Tom before I yeah, forget? Yes, then, yeah, 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 yeah. Then I'm going to bring in Tony and then you, Stephen, because I think Tony's okay. put put a hand up, and then I'll come sure, back to you. Sure. Let me just write this down, Tony, then Stephen. Okay, so so Tom, I am um, the, the the person that originally coined the concept of colonial um settler state vis-a-vis -vis Israel was Maxine Rodinson uh and he features very prominently um in one of the chapters in my book as uh, a way out a way forward in in how we understand Israel Israel's relationship included in that Israel's relationship to U.S. imperialism and he he he's really helpful um in that respect uh in enabling a relative critique of Israel vis-a-vis -vis other nation states uh, rather than an absolute damnation. And this is what he says um, in relation to your point. Um, a section of the left internationally maintains that Israel is a bastion of imperialism and her very existence a threat to progress and liberty in the world at large and in the Arab world in particular. Such notions, however, are reminiscent of the Mosa Volga ideological Marxism of the Stalin era. Uh, Israel, with all the limitations her dependence entails, has a will and a purpose of her own. She does not automatically obey all of the injunctions of the United States, nor yet those of an indefinable monster which this over-schematized Marxism calls imperialism. Israel is primarily interested in survival, which a current of Israeli politics, and he writes this in 1968, uh, 
uh, advocates a current of Israeli politics advocates for expansion. Obviously, that current of Israeli politics in 1968 uh, that advocated survival for expansion has has, has grown and grown. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess th there's more of that um, in the book, really, about, you know, it's important to... Um, uh, yeah, his contribution, I think, is is, is really important in, in how we understand Zionism, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Tony, please come in. Uh, yes, um, I want to uh, I want to agree with your assessment of uh, the left and anti-Semitism. But I also want to agree with Stephen um, in that this is this is a, a, a this is an ancient problem. And if anything, I think in your analysis of the historicity of the of the left in anti-Semitism, you don't go back far enough because what we really need to look at is how anti-Judaism before uh, before Jewish civil rights morphed into social anti-Semitism. And without understanding that, I don't think we can understand anything, and that's why I think, uh, you know, to Stephen's point, is what do we do about it? We've been trying to do something about it for as long as it's existed. Now we have institutes to study anti-Semitism. We have official definitions of anti-Semitism, more than one, of course, and um, we're still dealing, dealing with the same problem. At one point, at what point do you say, let's move on and figure out how to combat it instead of parsing it to death? Thank you. Um, I mean, I guess just on the history, um, uh, quite early on in the book, I talk about the prehistory uh of racism and within the prehistory of racism i talk about the very early representations of the jewish other and the muslim other uh, and how these kind of early ideas of the representation of the jewish other uh, basically got reworked reconfigured into anti-jewish racism um so i agree with you that um thinking about anti-jewish racism you know goes back a, a long way i think I'm not so sure about um, religious anti-Semitism and racial anti-Semitism. They're distinct, but I think um, religious anti-Semitism was the precursor, and I uh, and and, 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 and there's, there's certainly evidence from the literature that I read for the book that um, you know religious anti-Semitism, a lot of it was um, uh, 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 articulated in kind of quasi-racial terms. Um, uh, and kind of very easily reworked into racial anti-Semitism. Um, that really that... didn't start till after Jews came out of the ghetto. So, mm. yes, there's a direct link between anti-Judaism slash anti-Semitism and the social anti-Semitism in racial terms that grew up in the 19th century. Thank you. Um, Stephen, you wanted to come back... Yeah, you know, just just on the issue of David Miller. Uh, now, David Miller was an academic who was a, a professor at uh, Bristol University. I mean, people who don't know, and uh, he gave uh, various seminars and lectures to students about uh, essentially the the link between various Jewish communities in the United Kingdom and how it was all linked to the Israeli Embassy and Zionism and pressure being put on governments and so on to lobby for on behalf of Israel and all that sort of stuff. And uh, in the end, there was an investigation. He was sacked uh, because he's uh, not because of anti-Semitism specifically, but because his activities were deemed um, inappropriate was the word. The fact of the matter is that he's gone on. Uh, the fact of the matter is that when he was sacked, there were 200 academics, including academics from, so, uh, from Oxford and from Cambridge and other universities, obviously, who supported, uh, supported him and said he should never have been sacked. Uh, since then, he's gone on to co-present a, a show on Iranian uh, television, press TV, with, with another uh, uh, anti-Semite, Chris Williamson, who was an ex-MP uh, on behalf of the Labour Party until he was kicked out. 
uh, and every show is about Israel and it's about Jews. And the more the show has gone on, and uh, it, it, the more the, his mad conspiracy theories have developed. And I'm just wondering, because I'm not in the academic community, I, I happen to be a lawyer, I'm a practicing solicitor in, in England, but I'm not an academic. And I'm just wondering, Camilla, whether within the academic community, have, have positions changed in relation to, to, to what was the support for David Miller? Have people realized that the man is just a mad anti-Semite and, and, and he should not be supported in the way that he was when he was sacked? OK, thank you, Steve. I'm going to um, I'm going to respond to that. And then I'm going to um, allow Steve Cook to have uh, the final contribution before we start um, wrapping up. What's been interesting that there has been a a small number of signatories that I've noticed via social media withdrawing their names from the support statement to Miller as he's come out with more explicit um, anti-Semitic statements and ideas. What puzzles me is what puzzles me is the position of someone that supported him saying, oh, oh, okay, actually he is anti-Semitic. I don't buy the surprise. There was there's so much of David Miller uh in all of his forms up to and including the most explicit extreme form that he's now presenting uh, that was so obviously racist um, that I, I, I'm I confused by people claiming that they've only just realised that he's anti-Semitic. I think it's more a case of people saving face um, and realising that um, it doesn't look good on them um, to kind of keep supporting him because He's just saying more and more stuff that um, could get the rest of them in trouble. Um, there's certainly people, there's there's at least two people in, in, in mine and Leslie's branch um, that I think are still signatories to that letter. I think at least one of them uh, is, 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 dare I say, a lost cause. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, me approaching the other one, putting a little bit of pressure on is, 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 is really um, a good idea. Um, I'm going to hand over to Steve. Um, please unmute and hi uh i suppose it's really on the point i put in the chat but i think you you cannot underestimate overestimate overstate just how isolated the position you are putting forward uh is on on the left and when i say the left i do mean i mean broadly the left of that's outside the labor party now mostly that uh although a substantial section of it did join the Labour Party for, for, for a period in recent history. Uh, I mean, if you look at perhaps people who have heard of Jackie Walker and things, she actually uses the name of the group you're involved with, which I'm not a member of, but the AWL. It's almost like a euphemism for Zionist infected. Uh, and, you know, which I think is probably a euphemism ultimately for Jewish influenced, you know. and. That 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 language, you know, and you see that all the time. Uh, a, polit a politician or, or just an, anybody on social media says something uh, vaguely sympathetic to the idea that there is left anti-Semitism, and someone will sh it, it will tweet as if they were shouting, you know, A W L exclamation mark, which is the the group that you're involved with. Uh, so it's it is quite isolated that position on that on that on the I suppose the far or hard or you know or, or very left uh, and I suppose that's where I came from. I joined in the sense I was in a, a thing called the CPG at one point uh, that publishes the Weekly Worker, which you know, and then I joined the Labour Party uh, and came from a position of scepticism about how much anti-Semitism was, and then I just saw there was a huge amount of it coming from, from the, I suppose, the political community I was part of. Uh, so the issue about, you know, how you get that message across, it, it is very difficult. The whole constituency of people who think that if you use the Z word instead of the J word, it's not anti-Semitic, mm. or the I word 
for Israel. Uh, and you can say almost anything as long as it's the Z word or the I word uh, or in, well, the AWL word. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you know, for, for, I suppose for most of us, we'd say, you know, in this, probably in this forum here, you know, we can see it's anti Semitism, but so many of them uh, don't see it that way. And well, obviously, we're talking about a minority of of the country of of the of of uh, but but it and a minority of political activism i suppose but it's still substantial minority i suppose i find myself still engaging with that even though as stephen says it seems irrational <laughs> so. and i think you know within activist circles if the position of the awl is is such a minority position i think within academia you know the arguments of the book um, you know, the Marxist left isn't dominant in, you know, the academic social sciences, but this post-colonial left narrative is 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 extremely dominant. And um it's finding those those intervention points, isn't it, and continuing to chip away. But I'm going to suggest because no one else has indicated to speak, um going to suggest that we is it okay. Uh, Balax to to draw the meeting to a close. Can I can I offer sincere thanks to everyone uh, for attending and engaging and and patiently listening to my discussion uh, and and engaging in discussion. Thank you.